So this video is going to look at an acid-base neutralization titration. And we're going to standardize our titrant, which is what goes in the burette. And we're going to use that to work on an unknown analyte. And that's what often happens with titrations. You use a known solution to determine the molarity of the unknown. In order to do that, you're going to have to accurately measure the volume of both solutions. And this is not just something that you can do with an acid-base reaction. You can do redox titrations as well, and we'll do one of those fairly early in AP chemistry. So the first thing we have to do is think about what we're looking for in a titration. We're looking for the equivalence point. And in our case, with our unknowns, we're going to have an unknown acid in our flask, and we're going to add a base to it. So at the equivalence point, what we'll know is that the millimoles of acid in the flask are equal to the millimoles of base that we've added because we have a monoprotic acid and a monobasic base. So with a strong base and a strong acid, we will always find that the pH at the equivalence point is seven because the net ionic equation would be H plus OH getting us water, a neutral compound with a pH of seven. But what we will actually be finding is what's called the end point of the titration. And that's because most of the time, especially with an acid-base reaction, you're using a clear colorless liquid and you're making clear colorless products. So at the end point, this is where we will be able to see a color change in our solution. Sometimes, as in next year when we do our AP redox titration, we use a strongly dark purple titrant. And so once you add extra titrant, that purple color remains in the solution. In an acid base, usually when we use an indicator chemical, there are lots and lots of different indicators. So it's important to choose one that will change color near the expected pH of the equivalence point. So for this titration, which is a strong acid, strong base, we're going to use something called phenylphthalein. And it turns pink at pH eight. So it's a tiny bit past the equivalence point, but we would rather overestimate by a tiny amount than underestimate by a tiny amount. The first step in our titration is going to be standardizing our solution of sodium hydroxide. And this happens often with titrations because we want a very accurate number for our titrant is the more accurately we know the molarity of the titrant, the more accuracy we can get for our unknown. And some molecules do not make very stable solutions. This is a pellet of sodium hydroxide. It looks kind of boring right now, but sodium hydroxide is hygroscopic. It absorbs water from the air. So I'm going to put a little timer on here and we'll come back in a little bit and see what happens to this pellet because it will do a nice job of showing us why it's very difficult to get an accurate mass measurement for solid sodium hydroxide. Right here, this is starting to get shiny and it's because it has absorbed so much liquid from the air, so much water vapor from the air, that it's actually forming a tiny little puddle of saturated sodium hydroxide solution. So that means as this sits on the counter, it is gaining mass because of the water it's absorbing from the air. So in just 10 minutes, this has gained enough mass that I could certainly measure this with a milligram balance. So we saw in our little video that sodium hydroxide solid will actually start to absorb water from the air fairly quickly. And that added water will throw off the mass that we're measuring. So it's very difficult to get a very accurate molarity for sodium hydroxide 
making it from the solid. So since we know approximately what the molarity will be, we're going to use this acid, sodium hydrogen thalate, which is a monoprotic acid that's very commonly used to standardize base solutions. That's because it is a solid, so it's very easy to measure out and get a number down into milligrams. And it's fairly air stable and room stable, so you don't have that issue with it absorbing water from the air and the mass changing rapidly. So you can get an accurate mass and an accurate number of moles of acid in the flask. Once you have the moles of acid in the flask, you can titrate with the base to find the volume of base needed. And since it's a one-to-one -one reaction, the calculations are fairly simple. So let's look at how a titration for standardizing the sodium hydroxide would look. This is a burette, which is used in titrations. And burettes are used in titrations because they are graduated, which means they are marked, they have numbers on them, and they're very accurate. Number one, it starts counting from zero. So you're going to be going, I added one milliliter, I added two milliliters, I added three milliliters from here. The other thing to notice is that this is graduated in tenths of a milliliter. There are 10 lines between the one and the two. So I can look at the lines and see that I have put in 1.1. But we remember that we always estimate between the lines on a graduated instrument so that we can get another significant digit. So every volume measured with this kind of burette should have two decimal places. I can look at this and say either it's 1.10 exactly on the line, or I can estimate between the lines, maybe say it is 1.15 milliliters. So an important thing to do as you start getting ready to do a titration is to rinse out the burette with the solution that you're going to use as the titrant. That means that any solution that's left clean to the walls or any solution that's left inside the tip of the burette or inside the stopcock is the solution that you're titrating with. You always want to do this because if there's water or some other solution in there, that's going to change the concentration of your titrant, which we're going to worry about standardizing and getting as accurately as possible. So let's get the initial volume of sodium hydroxide solution in our burette for our standardization run. And it's very important that you are always at eye level if that means you need to drop this down a little bit in the clamp at first, you can. But I look about eye level to this. And a trick to help measure this more easily is to put a white piece of paper behind it. That helps us see the line more clearly. So now if I look at this, I am if I'm eye level with it, I am just a tiny smidgen above the eight milliliter line reading the bottom of the meniscus. So I would read this as 7.95 milliliters. So there's our starting number, 7.95 milliliters. All right, we're going to get the mass of our weigh boat so we can weigh out our solid acid for our standardization. That's potassium hydrogen phthalate, KHP. So we'll put this on. And that says it is 0 0.529. And I'm going to go ahead and use 529 because these things are so sensitive. Sometimes if I start talking or moving around them, it can change it. And I made sure to write that down. So if I want about a gram of solid potassium hydrogen phthalate, then I know my total mass when I finish putting the KHP in the weigh boat should be about 1.5 grams. So I'm gonna take a little bit of the KHP and put it in here and go ahead and get the mass and see how close I am. Okay. 
So now my mass is 1.19, so I still need a little more, but not nearly as much as I just put in. So I'll just put in a little more solid and get the mass. You never want to put mass of solid on the balance because that's a good way to get solid into the very delicate weighing apparatus. 1.3, still need a little more. And that's about 1.5, and I'm going to grab just a little bit more because I want to have four significant digits. So I want to be over a gram, not under a gram. I want to have a thousand milligrams at least. And then I will go ahead and close this. And now I write down the mass of the weigh boat. And sample 1.614 grams. So now that we know the mass of the weigh boat and the mass of the weigh boat and the sample, we're going to figure out just how much of this solid acid we have in the boat. Okay, I placed my solid KHP sample into the Erlenmeyer flask. And I rinsed the weigh boat with a little bit of water, so there's just a little bit of water in here already. Now, I actually do not really care how much water I put in at this point, because all of the acid is in the solid, and I've already masked the solid. So no matter how much solution I make, I already know how many moles of acid I have. So I'm going to just put in enough water here to make enough solution for me to be able to swirl it and see it easily. Say about here looks good. That's about 50 milliliters. And I'll swirl it around and get that to start to dissolve. That's one of the good things about Erlenmeyer flasks is that they are great for swirling. I'm not even worried if all of that dissolves right now because I know over time as I do the titration, more of this will dissolve. And we'll talk about why that happens more in AP chemistry. There's a very important step I can't forget though. I am making a clear colorless solution. I have a clear colorless solution in the burette and I am making water and a dissolved salt which is also clear and colorless. So if I want to see when my reaction is actually over, I need to add an indicator. And the indicator I'm using here is phenylphthalein. And I don't need very much of it, I just need a couple drops. Just a couple drops in there. Swirl it around so that it all mixes in. Phenylphthalein is colorless in an acidic solution and it will turn pink once I get to having a basic solution. So once I have neutralized all of my acid and added just a tiny bit of extra base, I'll be able to tell because I'll see a color change to a persistent light pink. And in order to see that better, I'm going to put a piece of paper underneath my flask. So we've been adding amounts here and we're getting close to what I would expect for this. So I'm going to add a small amount, just about a milliliter of titrant. And you can see here the color change is getting pretty pronounced. It almost looks like I'm done except when I swirl it and mix the solutions together the color change goes away. But that tells me that I am getting fairly close to the end point the persistent color change in my titration, so I need to add very small amounts to get a very pale pink. This is where titration start to get very finicky. I'm very close to the end point, and so I'm actually adding just one drop at a time right now, and swirling to see if that color change stays. And since that didn't, I add one 
more drop. So it is a very finicky process towards the very end. Also, I want to be sure that I'm not getting any drops on the glass. So if I think that that's happened, which I think it did, I'm going to go ahead and rinse the flask with a little bit of water to make sure that any solution on the glass gets washed down. And keep just adding one drop at a time until I get a nice pale pink. Okay, now we can see after adding this last drop, even though I'm swirling, the solution is still staying pink. And that means I have reached the end point. So I have added enough base solution to neutralize all of the acid that I had in my flask to start with. So now I need to get my ending volume on my burette and write it down so that I can figure out how many moles of base solution I had to add to get that to happen. So I have to crouch down a little bit to get right at eye level here, but I can see I'm in between the 27 and the 28 milliliters. So this is 27.5678 and looks like it's in between the 8 and the 9, just a tiny bit. So I'm going to call that 27.82. So my ending volume here is 27.82 milliliters. 27.82. Now that we have some data and we've seen this process a little bit in the video, let's use an example and you will use the actual data from the video to calculate the molarity. We're going to use approximately one gram of KHP for the standardization. Well, we know this is a reaction problem and a stoichiometry problem, so we absolutely can't do this in grams. And in fact, I'd rather do it in milligrams so that I can get a number of millimoles and not need to have a bunch of tiny decimals. So we have about, let's say, a thousand milligrams of KHP. We know the molar mass of KHP is 204.23 milligrams per millimole. So that means we have 4.896 millimoles of KHP in our example problem. So let's say in our standardization titration, we use 20 milliliters of sodium hydroxide. And we would find that by subtracting the initial volume from the final volume on the burette. We know that it's 4.896 millimoles of KHP. It's a one-to-one -one reaction. So that tells us we have 4.98 millimoles of NaOH. We want the molarity though of the NaOH. Molarity is millimoles divided by milliliters. So now we know we have 4.896 millimoles of NaOH in the 20 milliliters of solution that we added. In this case, our molarity of sodium hydroxide would be 0 0.2448, four significant digits, all of these. And you will use a similar, the same process with the data in the video to calculate the molarity of our solution. And normally you would do this more than once. You would do this to tell you that you, you got numbers to agree with each other and have a well-standardized solution. 